About a year ago here at Glorious HRD Industries, I was sent a radio from TID Radio, the TDH8. We're gonna call it the Generation 1 now, but then it was just known as the TDH8. After receiving the radio, which was advertised as a GMRS radio with an FCC ID, I realized quickly that a lot of the specifications of the radio were exaggerated or plain false. For example, I got TID Radio to admit that their 3 amp hour or 3000 milliamp hour battery that they advertised was mislabeled and it actually should have been much lower. There were certain things that had to do with the FCC ID like it just didn't exist even though they said it did. There were a lot of promising features on that radio and I don't really remember too much else about, well actually the Bluetooth programming software OD Master would send your plain text password that's on your cell phone to their servers in plain text. Regardless, TID Radio pulled the radios from the market. They did admit some wrongdoing to me, certain things that weren't done correctly, and they offered compensation for the consumer, the end user, you. And although TID Radio didn't send me the Generation 2, I got my hands on one. <laughs> uh, but I want to be fair and honest as I try to always be. And with that, today I'm going to test a few things to see, is the TID Radio Generation 2 getting better? Now this isn't a full review and evaluation, particularly, particularly, I can't say it. But what I'm going to focus on is I'm going to focus on the battery. And I want to test the battery to see if it is actually what's now advertised as 2500 milliamp hours or 2.4 amp hours. We'll see how many watt hours it is as well, because it looks like the same battery and the fact that that battery was relabeled from 3000 to 2500, I think they recognized that there was no way that this battery was ever gonna do 3000. Then we're gonna take a look at the power output levels. Uh, and finally, we're gonna take a look at this radio on the spectrum while I explain a few things. I will say this, I did notice that there is a difference, a significant difference from the generation one version to the generation two version. Yeah, USB-C on the charger, so that is great. Uh, good job there for TID Radio. Furthermore, another observation I've already made was if I look up this FCC ID on the FCC.report website, this is a certified radio for a VHF UHF. And finally, uh, nothing else really looks too much different on the outside of the radio that I could tell. I vaguely remember one of my complaints were to do with the programming cable and this lip right here. And hold on just a second. I may have given that TID radio programming cable away. I'm not sure. So I did find a couple of different programming cables. Things seem to fit a little bit better. So that's a good sign. Anyway, let's actually get into testing the power output level, which will lead us into testing the spectral purity. And in order to do so, we need to check, well, let's just check all three levels, low, mid, and high. But furthermore, once we get to the high power, that's where we're gonna do some calculations for our spectral purity. And uh, in order to check our power output levels, I'm using an MFJ power meter into a dummy load. It's, I see Mike's video, he tested the power output levels. It's the same meter that he has. Probably the same dummy load that he has too. I'm at 146.500 into the dummy load. And on high power, 10.7 watts, 10.65 watts. We're gonna go with 10.65 watts. And it does go as high as 10.75 watts, but that's uh, very quick before it reduces its power to about 10.65 watts. Let's go to a mid power. Mid power VHF uh, at a high 4.19 watts, but it levels out around 4.05 watts. Perfect. Now let's go to low power on low power VHF, call it about 2.4 watts. And let's jump over to UHF. Now, my testing on VHF wasn't conducted on the bottom portion of the band, or the top portion of the band. It was conducted in the middle at 146.500. Uh, so I'm going to do the same thing on UHF 444.0. Let's go 446. This time we're gonna start with high power on UHF, just like the last time. 9.22 watts for high power on UHF, that's pretty good. I know it's not the 10 watts, but, and it's been pointed out in prior episodes, I agree with it, is uh, your receive sensitivity would be way more important than your power out when we're talking about a minimal amount of wattage. Uh, but also, yeah, your receive sensitivity and selectivity, there you go. Let's go to mid power. Mid power on UHF. I saw five watts for a second, then it reduced to about 4.3, 4.4 watts, somewhere right around there. And finally, let's go to low power. 
starts at about 2.5 watts and reduces to 2.4 watts. So 2.4 watts on low all the way up to almost 10 watts on, on high power, 9.6 watts or whatever it was. Oops, that's impressive. Now this isn't advertised as a GMRS radio. I understand that it could be unlocked for GMRS. Uh, I don't know the answer to the power output levels on GMRS once it's been Unlock. Here's what we're gonna do for this next part. On this next part, we're gonna take those two highest power levels, and that's gonna be our VHF of 10.65 and our UHF of what I think was 9.6. One second. Just like I said, our UHF high power of 9.22 watts. We gotta make some calculations, and to do these calculations, let me actually show you. I'm gonna go to the computer here and show you how to calculate what kind of attenuation we need to test the spectrum analyzer. This is fun for me, so I hope you enjoy it too. On VHF, we have a maximum output power on high power of 10.65 watts, which is gonna be equivalent to about 40 dBm, 40.27 dBm. Okay, now the FCC rules and regulations specify something that might be a little confusing. Let me pull that up. I got to read this. What it says is the mean power of any spurious emission from a station transmitter or external power amplifier transmitting on a frequency between 30 to 225 megahertz. We'll talk about UHF in a second. Must be at least 60 dB below the mean power of the fundamental. But, and I say but, we are operating under 25 watts. So for a transmitter having a mean power of 25 watts or less, the mean power of any spurious emission supplied to the antenna transmission line must not exceed 25 microwatts, which would be negative 16.02 dBm, and must be at least 40 dB below the mean power of the fundamental emission, but not be reduced below the power of 10 microwatts. What does that all mean? Because that's a lot of baloney. Well, it's a lot to take in is what I'm trying to say, but what is it all entitled? We need to attenuate our primary signal to a point where we've attenuated it so it doesn't harm our spectrum analyzer, but also uh, an additional 16.02 dBm or 25 microwatts. And how do we do that? There is a whole huge calculation on it. The calculation looks like this. Real quick, I wanted to give a huge shout out to Larry Wolfgang, uh, WR1B, who wrote a great article in November 2015 about testing for spectral purity. And furthermore, that led me to contact the ARRL. And I just want to thank everybody over at the leak, especially Steve, K5ATA, as well as George, W1GKS, who were able to assist me in making sure that I had the correct information about how the spectral purity was tested. Thank you. Now you can see we need 56 dB of attenuation. That's easy, no problem, because we did all this complicated math. But I want to show you a quick shortcut as well. Because again, even though I'm testing this radio, I think it's fun to give a little bit of knowledge along the way. So that number was uh, 56.29, right? Well here, remember I said earlier 16.02. What happens if you add 16.02 to 40.27? Let's find out. Uh, well, negative 16 dBm, so 40 dBm, 40 dBm, 40.27 dBm, minus negative 16, or let's just say 16.02 plus 40.27 equals 56.29, which is the same as doing that whole log myth, log, um, log, Doing that whole log equation, and uh, that works for pretty much anything. So like, if you had five watts, you could do the same thing there. Uh, convert five watts to dBm, and then dBm plus 16.02. Anyway, we know we need at least 56 dBm of attenuation. I'm going to use 57 dBm of attenuation. Let's take a look at how the TID radio looks on VHF with... 10.65 watts into 56 dB of attenuation on a spectrum analyzer. So this is what I have, uh, FEHF high power, 10.64 watts. We have a spectral analysis or we have our spectrum looking like this. Markers 1D, 2D, and uh, 3D doesn't really have a spur, but it does kind of give us an idea for where our, our noise floor is, if you will. And yeah, 1D, our marker goes up to 55.53 dBm, okay? And then marker 2, which would be 
a harmonic. Let's see, 146 and 146. Offhand, I think that is a harmonic. I, I, the math in my head isn't processing, but that looks like a harmonic. Regardless, a harmonic still would have to meet the same purity requirements. And as we can see, it's at 8.48 dBm. Now, when we're talking about the difference between marker one and marker two, we're gonna label those in dB. And so if we take 55.53 and we subtract 8.48, we're gonna get what we see down here is 47.05 dB from the fundamental. Again, because it's from a spike to a spike, we're talking dB. Anyway, 47.05 dB is greater than 40 dB, which means there is more attenuation or it is at least 40 dB below the mean power of the fundamental emission. Right there, we're good. We are satisfied on our VHF purity results. And let's take a look at UHF here just real quick. Well, this is how it looks on UHF and a, a couple of things here. I will point out the reason I'm showing UHF in a second because some people will claim that there's no UHF standard uh, and that's just not necessarily the case. But one of the things I did want to point out is my attenuation looks like 16 dB. However, that's 16 dB of internal attenuation to the Regal DSA 815. The same thing would apply to your tiny SA. The other part of the attenuation is happening externally as the it's in between the radio and the spectrum analyzer itself. And you might be asking yourself, well, can you make that clearer to read my RBW? Well, let's see here. There you go. Regardless, what we have there is 58.90 dBm. And if we subtract 40 from 58, uh, well, let me just do the math real quick. All right, so yeah, let me just do the math again real quick. 58.90 minus 40 would be 18.9. And 8.82 is less than 18.89. That's another way to look at it. But regardless, if there was a emission standard that was similar to, similar to the part 97 307 section e uh, this would still be a pass and the reason i say that there is a standard for uhf on part 97 chapter 307 is because well you can't just say this is the wild west key up and it has signals that are going everywhere to include interfering outside of the amateur radio bands. So there is a UHF standard and no amateur station shall transmit or occupy more bandwidth than necessary for the information rate and emission type being transmitted in accordance with good operating practice. Emissions resulting from the modulations must be confined to the band or segment available to the control operator. Emissions outside the necessary bandwidth must not cause splatter or key click interference to operations. So part 97, chapter 307 of the FCC rules and regulations actually has these multiple subsections from A all the way really to F. And that's how UHF applies is because UHF still has to follow the standard of not transmitting more bandwidth than necessary and so forth. But I think it's safe to say that the TID radio TDH8 looks good on the spectrum. It's putting out some pretty good output power. Now the only thing I wanna do is I wanna test the battery. So I'm charging up the battery now. And by the way, this radio came with two 2,500 milliamp hour or 2.5 amp hour batteries. Um, I'm going to test all that and then I'll be back shortly with some cool graphs and results. I'm back after just a couple hours here. And well, hold on a second. Let me just do this real quick. There we go. I'm back after just a couple hours and uh, here are my test results. Now you're going to notice a red line and you're going to notice a green line. Allow me to elaborate. When I first hooked up this battery to my CBA5, it's a West Mountain Radio device, yeah, computer-based analyzer. I didn't have a good connection. So you see this weird fluctuation on the, the red line and then the voltage drops off because the connection was completely lost. So I restarted the test and now I should mention that I had almost, let's see here, let's just call it 0.1 amps or uh, what is that, that uh, 100 milliamp hours? Let's just call it that. And then if we continue to look on down here, as we continue on that green line to the right, that's the actual test. Let me move myself. There you go. And there's the actual test with the results. If we look at these results, what we're going to notice is we're going to notice that we have 2.455 amp hours, right? And then we add that 0.1. So we have 2.54 amp hours on the battery that's advertised as 2,500 amp hours. 
a milliamp hours, which is 2.5 amp hours, and uh, 16.383 watt hours on just the green test alone. What that's telling me is the battery is now advertised and performs as advertised. So instead of saying, hey, we have a 3000 milliamp hour, three amp hour battery, we now have somebody saying, and they did, they reduced the labeling on the battery. It's the same battery is my guess, besides they added that cool USB-C feature, but now they're not being deceptive in what the amp hours or milliamp hours of the battery are. So it's very good. Let's give it a final wrap up here. I've had some companies that sell radios online leave some nasty comments telling me that I shouldn't be testing these radios when they're not in compliance with FCC rules and regulations and when they're being deceptive. And my thought process on it is, is that's especially when we should be testing these radios is to confirm whether or not these companies are being honest or deceptive. And to be truthful, I feel like my review and evaluation, although could be considered harsh a year ago or eight months ago, probably led the way for these things to start becoming right. Now, I didn't test OD Master. I don't want to trust that software, and that's a personal opinion. But seeing that they've changed a lot of these other things, I would be led to believe that hopefully they, they are fixing that in, a, in an okay manner. But what I really do also appreciate, as I understand, is they're starting to support Chirp with this radio, so you don't need the OD Master software, which is nice. I tell you all this today, the power output, the spectrum, the battery, because if I were just to leave it as a horrible review in the past and also not show the good, I don't think that I would be doing myself justice. And I think that that would also be considered deceptive to you, the viewer, if I just left it in showing you the bad and never the updated good stuff. So thank you very much, uh, this side of the radio who sent me this radio for testing and evaluation purposes. This shouldn't be constituted as a review. I don't really wanna talk about the radio much further, but there are plenty of them online that you can go check out. I hope this video helped you out a little bit though, and I, and I hope you got some value out of it. If you did, consider hitting that subscribe button. Well, actually that's the like one. Hit the like button and then hit subscribe. Appreciate it, have a good one, this is the channel Ham Radio Dude 73.